Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Diederik. Um, I'm the CTO at Well Simple. Um, this is a different talk than probably other talks uh, at this summit. Um, this is very much what I would call a workshop talk, where I'm just sort of pitching a few maybe silly ideas um, to provoke maybe and to start a conversation and see if it resonates. Um, so I'm not going to tell you any best practices or how to run airflow in production. Um, my colleague and Anthony will do that at, at 12. Um, before I go into the actual meat of the talk, um, very quickly about Well Simple. So Well Simple is a, is a fintech helping Canadians realize their version of financial independence. We have about 2 million clients. We offer self-directed trading um, from stocks, ETFs, uh, a cash account for, for, for your daily uh, spending, or you can save for your retirement um, um, or your first home, right? So um, pretty standard fintech in that sense, but by far the largest uh, in Canada. When I joined Wealth Simple in 2018, one of my first decisions was to, uh, and back then I was the head of data platform and data, data science, was to introduce Airflow. I had worked with Azkaban and Uzi, and um, well, I'll cut the, short, the story short. I did not want to re replicate those experiences. So we jumped on Apache Airflow uh, version 1.9. Today we're running uh, 2.3, we're a little bit behind. Um, we're running about 230 decks um, every day, about 30 teams with more than 1,300 deck runs and 23,000 tax tasks uh, per day. It's powering our data warehouse. We use it for feature engineering for our data products. We use it to send our data to third parties like Salesforce, Brace, Hightouch. Right, so pretty, pretty what you would expect, but a pretty sizable uh, um, installation. Um, we've been working with, with Yarek uh, a lot in the last 18 months to, to, to great um, pleasure, on, I think, on both sides. Um, and I'll give you a very small thing about why I, am I talking about this topic today. So my, I'm old enough, as you can tell by my hair, that I actually um, I used to build my own Linux kernel, kernels back in the 90s, right? Uh, that's, that, nobody does it anymore. Um, and then during my postdoc, I studied open source communities like Firefox um, to really understand how they come together and collaborate. And then I, my formative years were at Wikipedia, where I helped build out uh, the first data lake, Hadoop, MapReduce, Hive, those things. So I've always had a very, very strong attachment and huge proponent of open source um, throughout my life, even though you might not necessarily expect that from me. Um, and now as the, in a position of a slightly more influence, also trying to contribute, contribute back uh, by open sourcing some of our own work we are doing at Valve Simple. So most recently we open sourced what we call our large language model gateway, a set of guardrails to help people use them securely and safely. Um, that's all about the context. What I want to talk about is about some of the questions I wonder about um, as, as in my role as CTO. And I, and I think these questions are not unique to me. I think they are, hopefully everyone can recognize them. When I say we, um, I really talk about we as data practitioners, whether you're a data engineer, data scientist, machine learning engineer, data, data platform manager, like we as a discipline or a craft I think we should have these questions. And if you, if you don't have these questions, then I would encourage you to start thinking about these. So I think we have a bunch of challenges and it is really about, we don't know enough about our data, if we are very honest, I think. Um, and again, um, it's we as a practitioner. So an individual, of course, might have answers to the questions I'm gonna pose, but as an organization, we don't know the answers to these questions, right? So. Because the, um, an individual engineer might know these answers, but like it's often tested knowledge, right? And so the engineer goes to a different team or leaves the company and woof, the knowledge is gone, right? We don't know the... So for example, are we deleting all of our customer data if a customer requests that? Are you sure? How, how, how are you sure that we are, that you are, right? That's a very hard question, right? We are 
like GDPR, for example, like we have to fulfill these, these requests. But at scale, it becomes very hard to actually be sure that you're doing it consistently in time, right? Are you sending sensitive data to third parties? Which third parties? What exactly are you sending? Tough questions, right? These questions easy to answer, I should say. It's actually very hard to answer. Right? You don't want to ping the random data engineer, right? That's not a scalable solution when you have a thousand engineers or bigger, right? So I think these are very important questions, but they're very hard to answer. So let me go a little bit deeper. So the first problem I think we have is we don't know what data we have. Our data ecosystem has become so fragmented. Microservice architectures have proliferated. Everybody is running dozens, if not more, operational databases. Maybe we're going to do data mesh. I hope not, but I think that will be that will worsen that problem. We have no SQL solutions, right? We have JSON as a data type where you just jam everything in. And now you have three levels deep nested data, and somewhere in the third level, there's some sensitive data, and nobody knows, right? These are not imagined problems. Everything I've seen happening, right? And I'm sure you've seen. We have too many sources of records, too many different applications, too many vendors, too many file types, right? It's really, really, really hard. And I think if you say, well, just invest more in data document documentation um, or have a data catalog, um, I think this is not bad in itself, but I think we need a more structural solution. The second problem related, we don't know what data we are sending where. Now, every data centric vendor, and there's many of them, tries to become the platform of choice. And so what they do, they make it very easy to send data to them and over all kinds of visualization and querying and other kinds of functionality. So you start using their, their tool, right? And this is happening. So people like in marketing, in sales, in products, they will come to you. We've got a new vendor. Can you please start sending data, right? Mixpanel, Amplitude, Marketo, HubSpot, Salesforce. Like it goes on and on and on, right? This is not an imaginary problem, right? So for example, uh, this is a quite high profile case here in Canada. Earlier this year, uh, a Canadian based company called McKinsey Investments um, discovered that a third party um, was compromised by, in a cyber attack and they had accidentally been sending their SIN numbers to this third party. The third party got hacked. SIN numbers are exposed, right? Imagine. So now, so you're like a client of them and, uh, and indirectly your data has been exposed because they're vendor and nobody knew that SIN numbers were being sent. It shouldn't have been sent, but it happened, right? So these victims of these data breach will be now structurally more likely to become a victim of identity theft. Of course you can say, well, that's sloppy, right? You should have paid more attention, invested more in governance, more controls. But I think we need a more structural solution, right? We cannot rely on people not making mistakes. That is not a scalable way of solving this problem. Then the third challenge, or sorry, problem I see, is that we often don't know who is using what data, right? Access, access data, blah, sorry. Accessing data is often typically restricted by data governance protocols and other things, but it's of, often at the table or the schema or folder or the bucket level. So pretty coarse still, right? And we don't actually know at scale what is exactly in a folder, in a bucket, in a, right? We just don't know that those kind of answers. So do people have a good reason to access this data? To add to that, as companies become larger, unfortunately, you have to pay more attention to insider threat. It's really, I wish it was not true, right? But so as a very small company, you have enough social controls. You know each other, first name, you recognize, you know what people are doing. And there's a strong enough sense of community that you know people will not do something silly. 
But unfortunately, when you become bigger and bigger and you hit a thousand employees or larger, then those social controls, you cannot no longer just rely on them. You need more than that, right? So you need to figure out maybe a data catalog or you need to make sure, make sure that you know, understand when people address, when use an email address field, um, why, why are they doing that? Do they really need it, right? Does, that, does, that, their, role, um, does their role justify that access? So these are, I think, three problems um, that we all, I hope, um, recognize, right? So naughty intertwined problems, hard, easy questions to ask, hard questions to answer at scale, right? So we don't know what data we have, we don't know where we are sending our data, and we don't know who's actually accessing the data. But there's more, right? We're seeing more and more regulations, right? I think Europe has been sort of at the forefront with GDPR. Um, in North America, there's um, new laws coming into effect. California is pushing hard. I'm sure we will see similar laws have, uh, arising from Asia, Latin America, Africa, right? And it is most likely that every set of countries or continent, not, probably not continent, set of countries, will come up with their own flavor, their own set of what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, right? And unlikely it's going to be compatible or fully compatible, right? You can imagine a Venn diagram. Hopefully they will overlap quite nicely, but I'm sure that's not going to work out like that, right? So I mentioned already GDPR and the right to be forgotten. Um, it's one of the most well-known examples of regulated lifecycle management of data. But ask yourself, how confident would you be if a company that you worked for received a request from a customer to delete their, their, their data? Would you be fully confident that you deleted everything, every single copy of that cu customer? If you are, huge kudos, right? Um, and tell me how you did it, because that is, that is a, a, a really challenging question, right? How can you prove that you truly deleted everything? The other thing, another challenge when it comes to how we use data is around monitoring what features we are using in machine learning products, right? Machine learning is really, really everywhere now, I would say. Um, but there's also an increasing awareness, fortunately, around how automated decisions through ML can have a significant impact on people's lives, right? As we are more and more relying on automated decisions, we are closing doors sometimes or opening doors to people. Are we giving people credit? Yes or no, right? It's a huge decision. We also know that there's a whole sphere of particularly demographic and data and features that have bias, right? And biased data in these models can have real consequential impact on people's lives. So how are we sure that we are not using those features in our ML models? And again, not do we, the individual data scientists would know because they build the model, but we as an organization, we as a craft, how do we know we're doing the right thing? It's a very important question, right? I think we have a hard time answering that right now. Finally, I think there's also a very exciting opportunity here, um, particularly on large language models. Um, I think we're learning very quickly that these models perform way better the more context you give them, right? And so the more data about data you provide, they actually become way more productive or not productive, uh, more accurate in uh, code completion, code interpretation, um, things like text to SQL, right? Like all those things. So those, this I think is an exciting opportunity. So three problems, two challenges, and a huge opportunity. Okay, hope you're still following. Um, a naive solution, and I think some companies do this actually, is like, well, we're just going to revoke access and we're just going to limit the usability of your data. We're just going to say you cannot send it to any vendor, you cannot do these kind of things with it, and that's how we are actually trying to prevent the worst from happening. Um, this happens. I would say it's not sufficient because the questions I posed at the beginning, you still have a hard time answering them, right? Just by, by limiting access, doesn't make you any better in answering those questions, right? So you made it slightly less likely that your data will be uh, leaked or misused, 
but fundamentally you're not much further than uh, than you were um, otherwise. There's something we tried at Well Simple uh, about three, four years ago. Um, we failed. All we, the, the, that's the TLDR. But what we did, we, we, we wrote our own, we, we call it the privacy gem um, enforcer. And basically what we did, we started um, misusing, I would say, the comments um, meta column in Postgres. And we would shove in a JSON as a string with annotations. So I say like, this field is confidential. This field is um, sensitive, right? And some, other, and some other metadata. And we put in a lot of effort. But the silly part, which we, we should have thought about way harder, is that we didn't think about the consumption side. So yes, we have these really nice annotations in most of our microservices, but they're not being used, neither by humans nor by machines, right? So like, okay. That is not great. So what I think we need then is something else. And I think we need an open and extensible way to describe our data. I think we need to move beyond data types and human descriptions. Very useful, keep doing that, right? But we need to be able to annotate beyond that. Is this an, an email is an email, right? That has a semantic value. I should not be able. To, I should not have to infer it from the from the column name that it's an email. I should be. I should be able to look it up, because we know that people are very bad. Right. The har hardest thing in computer science is naming things. So people will have different names for these things. So you cannot rely on column names. Right. So is a sin a sin? What makes it a sin? Right. I should be able to attach these annotations easily to a table, a file, an API, or any other mechanism that we use to transport and store our data. But I would say even if you push further, we can even do more advanced things. We should be able to add instructions on how to mask the data. That depending on who you are, this is how you would mask it. Um, this is how you would validate it. This is how you would, uh, can you impose restrictions on how to use it? Can you say this data can never be, can, can never be sent to a third party? This data can. Can we add these kind of restrictions on how to use? Right? Think of it as a, as a push for governance as code, a policy as code. And of course, this needs to be both human and machine readable. So some proposed principles. This is an ecosystem problem, right? This is not a one company specific problem. And data flows, right? Data isn't horizontal, it, it flows. It wants to flow. It wants to be used and reused by everyone. So I don't think um, we can rely on a, on a vendor to solve this for us. I think we truly need an open, open source standard uh, project around this because it's an ecosystem level problem, right? So have a way to describe the data and have a DSL to be able to action it. Make extensibility a first class concern. Make sure that the metadata propagates as it goes from the ultimate source to the ultimate destination, right? Perhaps, I see some folks from Open Lineage, perhaps we, we should work together on this. And as I mentioned, um, make it uh, human and machine readable. So I don't think, this is really sort of like my, my, almost my call to action or my invitation. I don't think um, this should be built in isolation, right? It's too easy to try to solve this problem uh, in an ivory tower, like we, we, like we did with the privacy gem. Um, and I don't think that many communities exist that actually can, can pull this off. But I do think, and this is sort of like, well, we'll see what happens here, but I do think that the Airflow community in particular might be able to pull this off. It won't be easy, right? But I think it is the community that has the best shot at solving this. First of all, it's a thriving and growing community. That's very exciting. But it's also a de facto standard for data engineering. Right? There's a huge user base. There's operators for an incredible large number of sources and destinations to pull data from and push it to, right? And so this propagation, you can you can embed. I think um, because you know, like, I worry that if you do, do it standalone, you don't get adoption. But if you make it a first class concern, a first class feature of Airflow, like then the adoption will be 
much smoother. I, at least that's my hypothesis, right? I could be very wrong, but that's my, my, my hypothesis, right? So it would be, make it much easier to overcome the cold start problem, right? Um, so this is my invitation then. Um, I've been I'm going through it quite, quite, quite quickly, but I also want to keep some time for Q&A. We would love to work with this community on this problem. I've, I've sort of laid out very, very broad strokes. Uh, what is the problem, at least from my point of view, how a solution could look like at a very like a 30,000 feet high uh, view. Um, but I would love to work with this, with, 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 with the community on this, on this problem. I think it's, it's about time that we, as a craft, as a discipline, start tackling uh, these questions. Um, we need an open source solution. I'm convinced of that part. Um, and so I would like to stay here and, and leave it with this invitation um, to collaborate on this, I think, exciting and challenging problem. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with, let's say, columns that were classified to not contain PI or sensitive data, but accidentally now do. Maybe it's like a general column like description or miscellaneous. Um, this standard seems like it would, um, it may not cover those edge cases as well. It's simple doing anything to look into data or ensure that, you know, it doesn't accidentally contain that information. Great question. Um, what, in general or well simple? Either. Well, I think, I think probably it's actually, the answer is probably similar. Um, I didn't mention this in the talk, but I'm actually a pretty old school person in the sense that I, I love data modeling. Um, and, I, and I think um, proper data modeling is extraordinarily important. And so the enforcement of the right data type uh, is, in, is very important. So we spend a lot of time in transforming the, like the stateful data from our operational databases into our data warehouse. Like there's a lot of time is being, being um, spent in exactly making sure that does not happen. But it's all manual, right? It's like you have to do a distinct on your column, right? You need a lot of exploratory work to actually manually inspect that it, nobody did it, right? Um, schema changes happen, so it's going to easily happen. That it might also break things. And this goes back to the proposal, right? Actually, like if you would have a, a validator, like if the business could, could define a validator on the column that you could execute, right? that would help a lot with this specific problem, right? But yeah, um, and then also like things like JSON make it even harder, right? Like, of course, everybody loves to store their data in JSON, but you basically, you optimize for the, the local engineering product team, um, but any consumer has now the responsibility and obligation to f actually verify that data. And, like, and so, yeah, um, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. It's a hard problem. Um, I have a question about uh, maybe more practical uh, ways that you envision this problem can be solved. So for instance, you mentioned the three questions, um, but talking about Airflow specifically, how do you envision Airflow solving this problem? So I think, ah, okay, I don't want to solutionize here too much, but you know, but I think if there's a way to Add some kind of a decorator to your op to each operator, and it gets passed on. So you would probably have to define it first, or even like if a third party can publish it, get a third party where you get the data from can publish it, can adopt the standard and can publish it, and then the first operator fetches the data and then it gets the schema or in all the annotations with it, right? And then it can pass it on to the, in your different tasks. Right? That would be, that would be an amazing way. But this is the cold start problem because you need to sort of like the, on the on the ultimate source side, you need to start adding these dimensions, the dimensions, these annotations, right? So that's where I, I would start. And so if you, if the third party doesn't provide it, then probably you will have to manually define it and then have it propagate. And so then hopefully there will be some sort of an API eventually that you can actually query Airflow and say, okay, where am I sending emails to? Where am I sending X to, right? Are we are we um, abiding by our own rules? Are we not using 
gender in our machine learning model, right? That would be like if ultimately there would be some sort of API where we can ask these kind of questions and get the answer from, right? That's, and that's basically then we have a true governance as code uh, kind of solution. But it needs to, I think the DAC somehow decorate that and propagate it. But again, um, I'm too far removed, so I should be very, take it with a huge grain of salt here. I will definitely re uh, defer to Yarek for better implementations. Maybe there is some uh, field for cooperation with the open lineage uh, to, to define some uh, some additional annotations yeah. there. Uh, and uh, like mark uh, pieces of data with appropriate like, level of sensitivity. And, uh, uh, so from like uh, open lineage community perspective side, we would love to work together and thanks for making a great case for like open standard that we're working on. Uh, as for the question, how do you see like uh, need for row level uh, information, metadata versus like whole table, column level from like financial services um, industry? It's tricky, right? If you do, if you do that at the row, like, so for example, it's well simple. There are certain things we cannot delete. Like we actually have a, uh, regulatory requirement to, to save data, even if you ask to be deleted, right? Because we need to make sure that our book of records does not change, right? So typically, you know, in our case for FinTech, row level deletion is actually not, not possible because it would, it would actually, we would lose information we cannot lose. Um, so that's why I think you need to be in column level, but I think um, specifying row level restrictions could be interesting, right? Because you can imagine that um, if there's different business units, and you have a fact table, and the business unit is only supposed to be seeing their subsection of the fact table, right? Those are, are, are I think, interesting, interesting use cases. I hadn't thought about it, uh, to be quite frank. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Diederik, thank you very much for the presentation. You're